uh, Mark identified six issues for me to talk about. I can't obviously treat there all those issues uh, in, in anything but a passing way, but I'll try and cover them in what I've got to say, and I will focus on the two issues which are first mentioned in that list, which I think are absolutely critical. The first being the civil justice must provide access to justice, otherwise what is justice? And secondly, that if we're going to do that, somehow we've got to find ways of enabling the public to have access to justice which is affordable. Because if it's not affordable and cannot get the benefit, the, the need of the public met at a, a price they can afford, again, it's, it, it is hopeless. Uh, the, the two elements depend hugely on government resources. But you know, government resources have not increased in any way sufficiently to meet the needs of the public for the services to which I have referred. And I am talking about the commercial world, the world of human rights, and I could also go on and talk about the position in the criminal field as well, but I'm going to ignore the criminal field, although it's very important in what I've got to say. You know, as it used to be said, this is like the Savoy Hotel, justice is available for all, as long as you can pay for it one way or the other. And throughout my period of involvement in the law, there has been a continuous tension between the need to pay for it and the need to provide it. And we've got another budget coming up, and we know that there are going to be cuts if, we, if the media have got it right. And we know that the justice area is not a protected area. And despite cut after cut, it's going to be likely that there will be further cuts. And that is not taking into account the huge inquiries that the government promotes to deal with concerns of the public again and again. There, there seems to be a different world where resources are not mentioned. But the effect on the resources totally that are available must be significant. Now, we all have got sympathy for victims, especially if they are victims who have been affected by sexual misconduct of the grossest kind. But if you are going to try and carry out the sort of investigation that Justice Goddard from New Zealand has uh, undertaken to perform, because no one else was acceptable to those who are, have come under the banner of victim, then you've got a huge task before you. She's got more and more put on her, her plate. And she's announced that it's going to take five years. I don't believe for a moment I will see the results of all her work because I don't think there's a hope that she will be able to do it all in five years. And I think also there's a huge danger that the task will be so great it could break the system. That seems to have been what happen, is happening in relation to the Iraq inquiry. So, uh, uh, and where does the government find the resources 
for the, the, one inquiry of this nature after another. We've still got the Iraq inquiry out, uh, out of the way. And really, one, I think, should be thinking about very carefully about priorities and expense. Now I again stress that I'm very conscious of the positions of the victims. But it's a little, uh, the legal system is a system for human beings. And how you can investigate a case satisfactorily where taking the, the main culprit is no longer alive and what is it going to achieve if the no main culprit alleged is uh, not able to give evidence? How can you have a properly balanced situation? But that's not what you're really concerned about. And I go back to the rather more narrowly <coughs> prescribed matters that Mark referred to. But I do feel that we are in a situation that we've got to cut our cloth in accordance with the resources that are available and we've got to try and see how we can provide access to justice and at a, a, what the system can afford. The <coughs> position with regard to legal aid I'm sure everybody here knows about. In 1949 when it was brought in it was a, a very extensive uh, provision of legal aid. Nobody could really criticize it because independently administered by members of the profession acting pro forma, uh, well, for pro bono, the situation was that they only had to be two tests generally which had to be complied with. First of all, the individual had to become within the <coughs> financial bands of those who deserved help, and that was uh, put on a, a sliding scale. <coughs> and secondly, they had to have a reasonable prospect of success. And generally speaking, it was across the board. And if somebody argued that they had not got the, 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 the right um, limit on their resources, that could be looked into. And they'd also to show <coughs> that there was a reasonable prospect of success. And that was done quite simply, usually, by getting an advice from an appropriate lawyer indicating the, the merits of the case. And on that basis, then Pearson would get legal aid. Well, now we've had legal aid cut down dramatically. Now, I, I, I don't criticize the government has, uh, about the cuts uh, that have taken place. No government is going to like a situation where they are committed to something which is demand-led. And the fact is that it was demand-led because uh, if the, the cases that arose depended on the public demand. So we have now areas extracted one after another. Then one comes to the situation, what is the scale of finance that's been provided? Well, you'll know from contemporary uh, experience uh, whether well, uh, the provision is satisfactory. But it's very limited. And the government was conscious it was very limited and therefore included in its provisions money for exceptional cases. And the ironic thing is that the resources that were available for those exceptional cases, despite the need, were initially not taken up. And they were very, very restricted resources. Because, of course, individuals were not seeing it as something which was available. And the lawyers also didn't think it was available. So legal aid is now very restricted. Then there's the question of how 
does that uh, impede justice? But well, my, my view is that it has been shown quite clearly that without legal aid, many people cannot bring cases when they should. I can remember when it was said, the people at the bottom were all all right because they could get legal aid. The people at the top were all, were all right because they were commercial concerns with their large resources. But the fact is that in the middle, there is a very an increasing number of people who fall between of both those categories, and to them, in the great, great majority of cases, it is a, a great problem how they bring cases. And it, it doesn't end there because it's a very considerable problem for the courts, because judges find it very hard to conduct cases, and I can speak from experience here, on one side legal have got barristers and solicitors, and the other side have not. How does the judge try and balance the scales between the two sides? What he will attempt to do as the judge is to give assistance to the litigant. And in small cases, and this is why the small claims court has been so successful, you could do it quite easily. But if you're in a big case, and it's got all the panoply of high court litigation, for example, the judge finds increasingly he or she is drawn into the battle. And by the assistance which he or she gives, it is, indicates very easily a, a sympathy for one side or the other. And either way, if your judge does that, the impartiality of our system is absolutely undermined. And the person who is unfortunate and doesn't succeed in the case says, I lost because the judge was helping the other side and not helping me. And uh, uh, it's so critically important that our courts used to always be able to give the litigant who got to before a judge the impression that well, win or lose, they'd had a, a fair trial. And so uh, there, those are problems. And this is why I think cutting at this, uh, the legal system is very, very sensitive issue. And it becomes particularly sensitive when it can have a double knock-on effect. First of all, lawyers find that on the resources that are available to those who want to bring proceedings, it's not worth their while to do so. And in certain areas, you find you can have a desert where it's impossible to find a lawyer with any degree of ease who's been prepared to take on the case. And it's also very worrying if it means that the attractions of becoming a judge are reduced. A, a, most judges who are appointed could still earn a, a living in, in, the, in their profession as a, a practitioner. But they got to, if our, our system depends on most majority of our judges being prepared to give that up and take on the role of being a judge. But if there should come a time when people are prepared in sufficient numbers to become judges who are of the quality and ability of those who we require to perform the job of a judge, that would completely undermine the quality of our system. And if you undermine the quality of the system, it's very difficult to restore the quality thereafter. And so these are the reasons why I think the two subjects I've identified are so important. Now, I keep my eye on the clock, as, as all lawyers now should be trained to do if they're appearing for a, jo a judge. You're my judge, and I've got to keep you in mind because I want to hear your questions. But these, these are 
reasons why I, I fear that we are in danger of killing the, 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 the goose who lays the golden egg and which has earned money to this country from abroad and at home through spe their skills and speciality in providing justice. And this applies in an area where Mark Solon played an important part, expert evidence. Experts are becoming more and more important, both in regard to practice and as witnesses. If you have experts who know that complicated subjects that can come before the courts, then they can make a huge contribution to dealing with the work in an efficient and effective manner. I'm involved with a body called Prime Finance, who provides experts to deal with these big financial cases which we've had to get, deal with in our system and in other systems on an international basis, where a large bank has collapsed or a matter of that sort. And they, first of all, act as an assurance of the quality of the experts they provide to give evidence. But they also provide expertise in managing the disputes because of their experience. And it's amazing what different timescales can be produced by expertise. And the new financial list in our commercial court, as indeed the commercial court building itself, it provides the sort of setting that is needed for dealing with litigation in the world we live in now. And I, my fears for the future of litigation, are, apart from the concern about whether we'll continue to attract the top practitioners to become judges in the commercial court, there are uh, uh, the, the facilities of which are needed to deal with the work expeditiously. But you know, if you do develop expertise, then that provides what one Chief Justice said, a motorway for litigants who want to come to court. And that in itself generates more business than before. Because, and I think that's a good thing, because if they need justice, they should be able to go to court. But of course it does mean that we've constantly got to be moving forward and finding ways which we can do things more efficiently and more quickly. And that we have it nowadays external services that will help us to do that, which were non-existent in my days of practice, where a discovery can be overtaken by a body, a specialist body, that all, any particular issue you can think of, there will be some specialist body who concentrates on that and doing it in fit more efficiently and more quickly than it's dealt with, been dealt with in the past. But all of this is producing what I referred to as the motorway, which generates more and more business. And we really must be continuing to review our skills so as to ensure that we can do that. And now for the final word that I want to say, as the clock approaches 9.30, uh, is about standards of conduct, which was one of the matters that were listed by Mark. And it is critical throughout this that we concentrate on our professional standards, whether we're judges or practitioners, because if the public are going to have the faith which they need, and uh, I include the uh, one in the public, large commercial concerns, often international concerns, then uh, we've just got to try and find ways within the competitive and money-driven system that we already have, how we can do that. We've got to be responsible in the way we charge. But the difference between being a professional and, do, uh, and being a non-professional and providing services is that the professional person 
will ch charge reasonable fees, but will regard it as unprofessional and have no regard to what he's doing in return for the fees he receives, and make sure that they are responsible fees. And I'm afraid it's all too easy for us in the competitive world which, in which we cease to exist to forget the importance of being professional in the way I've just described. Now, that's my opening. I hope it does say things which you regard as relevant. I think they are important and I'm very happy to answer questions. Yes, Lord Wall, thank you. Uh, access to justice. Do you think this is being denied by the government by increasing court fees, possibly frightening away foreign litigants, uh, threatening to surcharge city solicitors, don't, don't surcharge uh, consultants in Harley Street, um, by suggesting that in criminal cases, though this has since been dropped, that defendants should pay their own way and contribute towards the cost of the case. These are litigious matters, in non-litigious, which of course is not what you're speaking about, the possibility of increasing, people can't help dying, but they can help litigating, increasing probate fees to £20,000. Do you believe that it's right for the government to take these measures, or should fees, funds, come out of general taxpayer money, like the National Health Service, the police, defence, and any other public facilities and public services that we have? Well, that's a very, very good question and does raise very substantial issues. And issues which I think some of the general remarks I made reflect upon. First of all, if the lawyers and the judges are to exercise the highest standards, so should the government departments that deal with the justice system exercise similar standards. And I certainly take the view that it make, it, extracting court charges, which in some jurisdiction would, would be regarded in themselves as of doubtful constitutionality, the government must be responsible and must relate those to the services that are provided. And I know the government will say, well, that's exactly, what, or I hope they would say, is that is exactly what we, we've done. But one sometimes thinks, and one can't help thinking, as possibly you have in asking me questions that you've had, that the question of proportionality has been lost sight of. And certainly I would not myself approve of a government asking fees which are outside the scope of what is provided. By all means, you could charge a reasonable fee towards the costs of providing a service. But it's the obligation of the state to fund our system. And in doing it so, it shouldn't place the burden unduly on a particular section of the community. Next question. May I just raise a question actually, which uh, a lot of people, probably <coughs> our, our audience here, will say, uh, I've got a, a young person who wants to enter the law as a profession. Would you advise them to say, yes, it's a great profession, or, my God, get out before it's uh, too late? <laughs> yeah. Well, Mark, I have no doubt I would advise them it's a great profession. And it should be a profession that anyone can take satisfaction out of being a member of it. And I always thought that I was very privileged to be practicing and become a judge within our system. Because unlike in some countries I've visited, the career of being a lawyer and the career of being a judge within the system was regarded generally by the public as an honourable employment and one in which society on the whole respected. 
And I would hate to think that our standards would think, sink below the standard that were I knew, so that the reputation of the profession was to be tarnished. Whenever we look in sport, unfortunately, no matter how enthusiastic we personally may be in relation to the sport, things happen which really worry one. And I am now sit as a member of the House of Lords as a crossbencher. Things happen in the political arena which unfortunately have tarnished the image of politicians and sportsmen. We've got to take great care that we don't damage the occupation which I at any rate love by making by adopting standards which were in the past would be regarded as unacceptable. We can discard practices which are no longer relevant to contemporary times, but we can't ignore the standards that used to exist and say they, know they are no longer relevant and we don't need to be professionals anymore. We can treat ourselves merely as in it for what we can get out of it financially. A gentleman there, please. <clears throat> My name is Tarek Chaudhry and I'm for Kingdom Solicitors. My question is, uh, what is your comment about uh, uh, <coughs> British Bill of Rights uh, in place of uh, Human Rights Act? That's a... a, a it, it all depends what's going to be in the British Bill of Rights. I think the <coughs> present Human Rights Act does, serves, serves as well. But I don't, I'm not entrenched, and if they produce an, a, a new British Bill of Rights, and we're waiting to see it, and I'm a, a member of the Joint Committee of uh, Parliament, which is looking into the question of human rights, then I don't have any entrenched views which says we can't have our own Bill of Rights. But one thing I have, think is absolutely critical is that they, it should not be a bill which is it, it provides inadequate rights. And uh, I, I, I hold judgment until I've seen the evidence. And the evidence will be what the government proposes when compared with what exists here. But it's got to be something worthwhile because if we have a new British Bill of Rights, then we're going to have a lot of work to do both in the courts and as lawyers, to, to absorb that new bill. We, since the old Bill of Rights came into being, day in and day out, the courts and lawyers have been dealing with it. And there's a accumulated a wisdom about applying it. We don't always get it right, but we have, by over time, seen things that have not been constructive and tried to put them right. But I don't know whether that's all going to be swept away. But if it is, as I think it will have to be, because it's a new document and it will have to be reconsidered, there's going to be great uncertainty and it will take a number of years to work it out. What is the consequence of the new bill? 